Hi, my name is Nathan Brummel, and I'm a professor of Systematic Theology New Testament at Divine Hope Reform Bible Seminary. I'm glad to be with you today to talk about the writings of Thomas Aquinas. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about Thomas Aquinas as a profound thinker, and then also as a profound thinker who is therefore also a very profound writer. Now, if you had lived in Thomas Aquinas' day, one thing that would have struck you is how hard the man worked. And you have been struck by the fact that he wrote day and night, even though you probably wouldn't have seen him with a pen in his own hand writing. And by a pen, you know, I'm not thinking of, of a modern pen, we're talking about a quill. But you would have seen him surrounded by men who did have their quills in their hands and were scribbling feverishly. Why is Thomas Aquinas famous today? He's famous today because of his writings. If he had just been a brilliant teacher, yes, he would have had an influence, but the reason why he became so famous and has had such a long influence is because of his writings. And so today we want to talk about Thomas Aquinas and his writings, but we want to also talk about him as the deep thinker he was that resulted in him having some very profound writings. Let me get, give you a sense of what his schedule was like. Throughout his mature years, he would get up at sunrise, before sunrise, to say a Mass, and then he would go and he would listen to another priest say the Mass. And then he would work straight through all the way until 9 o'clock at night. So here he reminds us of Jonathan Edwards, who centuries later would try to spend 12 to 14 hours every single day in his study. Well, Thomas Aquinas would start studying in the morning and basically he'd continue working and writing, that is dictating his writings, until nine o'clock at night. So this man engaged in serious, serious hard work. Now, if you would have peeked into the room where he was working, you'd have seen that it's a very active place. Sometimes people have painted pictures of Thomas Aquinas as if you know, he's just this very serene, peaceful person that, you know, he's sitting with this quill and he's by himself and he's, you know, just having profound thoughts as he sits there quietly. You know, that's far from the actual reality. The actual reality is that there would have been a frenetic pace going around him. He would have been surrounded by men. He would have been dictating to one guy one book or one writing, dictating to another guy a different piece of writing or a different letter and to a third guy, and a fourth guy, and maybe even a fifth secretary. So you can imagine what it's like to have these men scribbling away with their pens, and he first tells one person a couple sentences right, that guy says right, he goes around, and Thomas Aquinas is bright enough to keep everything ordered in his mind. And when he comes back to this book he's working on, he remembers, okay, what he needs to say next. Now, he was a very pious individual, and so when he would begin his work, he would immediately pray and ask for God's help. But what would also have struck you is that in the middle of him dictating to these different secretaries, if he ran into a hard problem or he didn't quite know what to say, you'd see that this big guy would suddenly get down on his knees and pray and beseech God for help to solve the problem. He seemed to be absorbed by his work. I think today we would say he was a workaholic. He was so absorbed by his work, it seems like it's all that he did and all that he cared about. He didn't care how he dressed. His contemporaries commented about how his clothes were not taken very well care of. And then what about food? Well, how did this ox of a man keep his energy up? Well, he ate, but what we're told is that it's not like he really sat there and really enjoyed his food. In fact, some of his uh, helpers would bring in some food for him, and he would just keep on working, keep dictating, and he'd eat in the midst of it. hardly even notice that he had eaten. And if you'd ask him, what did you have for lunch? You probably couldn't even tell you. Now, another thing that you'd have noticed about Thomas Aquinas is study is that due to his large girth, he had had a carpenter cut a very, very strange desk out for him. He had a carpenter cut out a crescent shape in his desk so that when he sat down, you know, his belly could fit into the crescent. And he had a great sense of humor about this. When people joked about his weight or came in and they noticed his desk, he would laugh just as hard as anybody at his uh, obesity. So there he would be hard at work in his study, and he wrote a lot. I mean, even though he died before he turned 50 years old, he wrote 60 books or so, and he wrote 10 million words at least. 
throughout his career. Now, it's a good thing that he didn't write down all those words himself, or no one would have been able to read what he was saying, because his penmanship was terrible. His writing was infamously unreadable. The other day I just wrote something, and then someone said, well, I can't see what you wrote there. Well, Thomas Aquinas, his handwriting was so bad that they called it Litera Inintelligilibus, or unreadable writing. But the Dominican order provided him with amanuenses, or secretaries, to whom he could dictate his writing. So he would have three or four or five of those all functioning at the same time, busy with their quill and their ink. Well, because Thomas Aquinas could get thinking so hard about problems, whether arguments or theological problems or problems with heretical teachings like the Manichaeans, uh, we find that he could be somewhat absent-minded at time, and there's one famous story about that. One time, King Louis IX of France invited Thomas to come for a banquet in his, in his palace. Now, Thomas was not so excited about that. Thomas really didn't care about rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous, and as a friar, I suppose he certainly didn't value eating you know, fine and rich foods like would be served at a king's banquet. So he had no interest in going, but the Dominican leadership, they said, no, you better go, because there were always some issues, you know, that were sensitive issues that the king would deal with, and they wanted the Dominicans to be in the, the good favor of the king. So they said, no, you need to go to this banquet. And you know how the French love to talk. Even back in those days, the French were famous for their witty conversation. In the centuries that, that were in the future, the French would even become more uh, infamous for that. And so at the banquet, the people who were in the king's court were talking with each other with all kinds of brilliant comments. And yes, you guess it, Thomas just sat there quietly. Chesterton calls the overweight Thomas who sat at the dinner of the king at the king's banquet a reluctant bulk of reflection. A reluctant bulk of reflection. So he's just sitting there and he's, he's his mind's like a hundred miles away. And then there came a moment during the banquet when suddenly everyone fell quiet. And G.K. Chesterton describes what happened next. He says, and then suddenly the goblets leapt and rattled on the board and the great table shook for the friar had brought down his huge fist like a club of stone with a crash that startled everyone like an explosion and cried out in a strong voice, but like a man in the grip of a dream, and that will settle the Manichees. Coinus had yelled out, There! There is the final and conclusive argument against the Manichaean heresy. G.K. Chesterton always was a little fast and loose with the facts, the actual language he might have used. Well, the diners at this banquet, they turned in shock to the king. How is then the king going to respond to this breach of etiquette? Louis the Ninth, he understood the absent-minded professor. The king asked the secretary to speak to Thomas, and the secretary first saw, thought that he was being told to rebuke the friar. But then the king said, oh no, take a note. Find out what is the conclusive argument against the Manichaean heresy. So the secretary went and transcribed the argument, and it must have been a very good one. It ought not to have been forgotten. But you see that anecdotal story points us to the fact that Thomas, the writer, had a very profound interior life. He is the person who thought things through. He mulled things over. You know, and because of that, because what he really valued was theology and understanding theology and philosophical issues. You know, he really wasn't caught up with social interaction and, you know, hanging out with people and just chatting. So instead, to other people, it seemed like uh, he was just in another world. And you look at him and you'd be in a room with a bunch of people talking to each other. You look at Thomas, he's kind of just sitting there and all of a sudden, you notice he has a big old smile on his face. He's looking really happy. Well, he has just had some type of insight. And he could probably go and make sure he wrote it down somewhere. One time he said, A beautiful idea has just occurred to me for the work on which I am engaged at present. 
my pleasure in this simply burst forth in delight. So, you know, he lived and breathed and dreamed theological and biblical and philosophical issues. And his power of concentration enabled him to take things through to their logical conclusion, to make profound arguments. So the point I'm making is that to be a profound writer, first you have to be someone who is thinking hard. And Thomas was such a profound thinker. I want to allude to a few of Aquinas's voluminous writings. I want to talk to you about some of his key writings. Now, he is thought to have written 10 million words. He died just a little short of 50 years old. So it is supposed that every day of his life as an adult, he needed to write around 14 pages, you know, in what would be a modern English page in order to accomplish this. He penned commentaries. His most famous commentary is his one on the gospel accounts. And I, had, I hadn't even been aware of that until a few years back. He also wrote commentaries on Paul's epistles. The Gospel of John, he wrote a commentary on Isaiah, and another on the book of Job, for example, and others too. But his most well-known one is his Catena Aurea, which is a commentary on the gospel accounts. And to this day, Roman Catholic theologians will claim that it's the best commentary on the gospel accounts ever written, partly because they're biased towards some of his interpretations. Now, what he does in this famous commentary is that he draws on the church fathers, and he'll take quotes from the church fathers and give what their best explanations are of the text of the gospel accounts. And that work has now been translated into English, and so it's widely available today. One can also find Thomas's commentaries on the Pauline epistles online today. So the other day, for example, I wanted to check out his commentary on Ephesians and his one on Romans. And I was able to look them up and find them, and they're freely available online in English. Now, some people might be surprised that Thomas even wrote commentaries. But remember, he wasn't just a systematic theologian. He, he didn't just teach an Aristotelian approach to Christian theology but he also was a Bible teacher. His commentaries grew out of his classroom instruction. He was a master of theology, which means that his job was to lecture on the very text of the Bible. Remember when he was a bachelor of the sentences, then his job was only to lecture on Peter Lombard's sentences. But once he became a master of theology, we would say like a full professor, then he had the right now to lecture on actual books of the Bible. And so what he would do is, as he lectures on the Bible, he would call insights from the church fathers, from commentaries, and he would bring them into his lecture notes. And he would also do his own exegesis of the passages, and the result would be is that he would have very complete classroom notes that he would then convert into commentaries. He also needed to engage in careful exegesis of the Bible because guess what he was? He was a Dominican friar. And what, what were the Dominicans? They were an order of preachers. So he needed to exegete the word for preaching. Every priest was expected to preach the word not only to the friars, but also to the common people. Now, an important book, probably his second most important book, is his Summa Contra Gentiles, or Gentiles. Now, here is a copy of that. It is a multi-volume work, the Summa Contra Gentiles. And what it is, is it's a work of apologetics. In this work, he defends the Christian faith over against Islam, unbelievers and the Jews, or any opponents of Christianity, or any heretical groups. Now, you're going to learn that his Summa Theologica was his greatest masterpiece, but the Summa Contra Gentiles was his second most important book. Now, in the past, people thought that he had written it mainly for missionaries, and maybe that, that was partially what he did. The book was really a summary of Christian responses and Christian apologetics over against Gentiles or any opponents of the Christian faith, so there were replies to Islam. Remember, at this time, 
there was a great conflict between Islam and Christianity. Remember the Crusades had been engaged in. Also, at this time, the Muslims still controlled most of Spain, remember. And so it was a very relevant matter, and there were some people who were very courageous and even crossed the Mediterranean to North Africa in order to try to bring the gospel to the Muslims. So this book is in a very extended defense of the Christian faith against the arguments of pagans, heretics, and Muslims. And what he does in this work is he demonstrates the harmony of biblical revelation. You know, opponents of Christianity always try to claim that somehow Christianity is inconsistent. Islam, for example, attacked Christianity because of its teaching of the Holy Trinity. Well, what he did in this book is he defended the consistency and harmony of Christian teaching. So that was his second most important work. Now, his most important work, what we call his magnum opus, that is his greatest work, was his Summa Theologica. Or Theologica. Now, I have two different sets of this. One is a smaller set like this. It's a multi-volume set, I think about 13 volumes. And then I also have another set, which is a much larger size set. And this is nice because it has on one page, it will have the Latin text. And then on the, this is the English side actually, and on this side, or each, each column, but this is the Latin and this is the English. So this is the Latin and that is the English. So the beauty of this is that you can see the original Latin as it came from the pen of Thomas Aquinas, and then you can see a nice English translation of it next to it again. This also is a multi-volume work. So this is a serious work. It's a very large work, and yet it was incomplete at the time of Thomas's death, as we shall see. Now, these books are a challenge to the readers. For example, I'm not sure how many of you will end up reading any or all of Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica. The reason why is it's just large. It's multi-volume. But it's really not meant to be read through either. It's more like a, I don't know if an, we would say an encyclopedia. It's more like something, let's say you have a question about angels. Well, then you would turn to this section in this book where he discusses angels. Or if you have a question about sin, you can turn to the section where he discusses that. Or if you have a question about the Trinity, you can turn and look there. So it's more of a resource like that rather than something to be read right through. It's also a challenge to read because it contains 512 questions. In other words, 512 main topics really. And then it has under that 2,669 articles. And then to get a sense of how complete and complex this is, it includes 10,000 objections to what Aquinas takes to be correct. And then yes, yes, at least 10,000 responses to the objection because he responds carefully to each one of these objections. Now, as Thomas does this, what he does is he selects the best arguments of his opponents. And then he also, in a very calm, logical way, although they're not saying there isn't fire at times, but him there is, he responds to these objections. He takes them very seriously. Now, Thomas Aquinas organized his Summa Theologica very, very carefully. And why, why were the medievals like that? Why were they so logical and orderly? Well, I think the order reflects the fact that all Christian theology is related and in harmony. That's what Aquinas believed. It's also an attempt to be encyclopedic. Thomas wants to treat the central theological issues and the main Christian doctrines of the Christian faith as you do, for example, if you're training men for the ministry of the word. But also that order reflects the fact that God is a God of order. Peter Kreeft explains the order in which Thomas treats the topics contained in Christian theology in his Summa. He says, the structural outline of the Summa Theologica is a mirror of the structural outline of reality. It begins in God, who is in the beginning, it then proceeds to the act of creation and a consideration of creatures centering on man, who alone is created in the image of God. Then it moves to man's return to God through his life of moral and religious choice and culminates in the way or means to that end Christ and the church. 
So that's very interesting. So Thomas begins with God, and then he discusses man as created by God, and then he talks about how fallen man needs to return to God in order to praise him. Now, the Summa contains really what are written down debates. Not that the debates actually happen. Now, in the past, Thomas's writings were caricatured as dispassionate debates, and Aquinas was pictured as being someone who's always very calm and rational. Now, it is true, and what will strike you in his works is that he, he sort of renounces rhetoric and focuses on clarity and simplicity in his writings. He is, in other words, he avoids heat because he wants light. But at the same time, contemporary scholars have cured us of the notion that Thomas lacked passion in debate. His writings often exhibit passion and vehemence, especially when he's dealing with some very controversial matters. The authors of the Christians, the first 2,000 years, rightly claim that Thomas could be a feisty, intellectual scrapper who took overt pleasure in reducing a rival case to ashes. Yes, don't we all enjoy doing something like that? But disputations back in Aquinas' day were a serious business in the medieval university. T today, students would be better students and thinkers and arguers if they were trained like medieval students. I think that's why today it's so good for young men and women to be involved in debate. Because when you are in, in a debating society or you're in a debate in a speech class, you're basically learning how to develop your arguments and then also respond to your opponents. Now that was something that they majored in in the Middle Ages. Peter Kraft writes, To the medieval mind, debate was a fine art, a serious science, and a fascinating entertainment, much more than it is to the modern mind, because the medieval believed, like Socrates, that dialectic could uncover truth. So notice what's going on. Aquinas involves himself in debate and dialectic because he thinks this is a way, actually, to arrive at what is better and correct and true. Now, in the Summa Aquinas, we'll begin each section with an objection. The objection contradicts the main thesis that he will argue for and defend. And what's striking is that he always takes these objections seriously. He rebuts each one of them. There will be like three objections, and then there will be three responses to the objections. Everything is very organized. The Summa itself, the whole book is divided into four main parts, and it's a little confusing because they are as follows. There's the first part, which is Roman numeral one, which is called the prima pars. There is the second part of the first, it's called. So it's the prima secundus, and there's a Roman numeral one dash two. And then the third part is the secundus secundi, which is a Roman numeral two dash Roman numeral two, which is the second part of the second. And then finally, the fourth part is the third part. Roman numeral three, tertia, pars. Now the whole work is divided into various treatises on the major topics of Christian theology, so that there are titles like On the Creation, that's the subject, that's today what we say like the chapter, On Man, or On the Law. And then under each one of those treatises, we have a number of questions. So things are divided up because under the issue of creation, there might be a whole number of issues that might need to be dealt with. So these questions then are divided up into articles, and as Peter Crave says, the articles are the basic thought unit of the Summa. And it is here in the articles that we find the objections, the rebuttals, and Aquinas defending his thesis. The Summa Theologica was the most systematic formulation of Christian theology to that day and its influence would go up and down. Initially, its influence was very small, mostly read and studied by Dominicans. Later, at the Anti-Reformation Council of Trent, the council would basically affirm Thomism. They would count him as a doctor of the church. And then as time went on again, during the Enlightenment, the influence of Thomas waned. But in the 19th century, very interesting, 
Unfortunately, it revived again. The writings of Thomas were studied anew, by, especially uh, led by a British theologian, John Henry Newman, who led a resurgence of Thomistic thought. And then in the 20th century, who'd have thought in, you know, in this, in the, in the past century, that there would have been a revival of this medieval Roman Catholic theologian, but there was, led by a French theologian named Etienne Gilleson. There would be a renewal of Thomistic studies and led by others as well. It was especially though in the 20th century at the end and in the early 21st century that Protestants began doing more scholarly work on Aquinas. Already in the post-Reformation era though, the Christian theologians, the Reformed theologians, were reading Aquinas and were reacting to him and were in fact using some of his scholastic methodologies and careful argumentation to defend Protestantism. But what we found in the 21st century and in the last century is that more Protestants have been actually studying Thomas. Also something you should be aware of is that in his Summa, Aquinas provided arguments for the existence of God. And these are his famous five-fold defenses, or his five-fold defense of God's existence. These arguments have been debated ever since. His five arguments uh, involve arguments about the government, governance and operation of the cosmos and how they pointed to an intelligent force who is guiding the world to a good end. He argued that there must be a cause for this world. Now what's interesting to me is that his argument from design really is a form of the intelligent design argument that is being developed today in the 21st century in very striking ways by anti-Darwinist scientists like Stephen Meyer in his new book, The Return of the God Hypothesis, Compelling Scientific Evidence for the Existence of God. But Thomas's great work remained unfinished. The reason for that is towards the end of his life, Thomas would suddenly stop dictating. Therefore, the final parts of his book were never completed. At the time of the great Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, the works of Peter Lombard and Thomas Aquinas were displaced in Protestant universities by Philip Melanchthon's Loci Communis in the Lutheran schools and John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, especially in the Reformed universities. J. David Lawrence writes that only Calvin's Institute of the Christian Religion approaches Thomas's thorough and complete treatment of doctrine. So today we've talked about Thomas as a writer. Now what we're going to do in the next session is we're going to look at Thomas's teachings on divine sovereignty and sovereign grace by mainly looking in the Summa Theologica. And there we will discover something very surprising, at least surprising to some. We will see that Thomas Aquinas seems to be a Calvinist. That is, he seems like Augustine to believe in sovereign election and sovereign reprobation. But we'll wait to talk about more about that until next time. So for today, goodbye and have a blessed day. Didn't we go through one of his books before?